In this video, we're going to take a look at using the formal epsilon delta definition of a limit and applying that to a quadratic function. So we're going to prove that the limit as x approaches 2 of x squared is equal to 4. So I've written up here what our goal is. Given an epsilon bigger than 0, which is going to be a vertical distance, and we want to make the y values of our function within that distance of 4, we want to find a delta bigger than 0. That's going to be a horizontal distance that we're going to use to control our x values. So that if 0 is less than the absolute value of x minus 2 is less than delta, that's just saying x isn't 2, but x is within that distance delta of 2, then the vertical distance between x squared and 4 will be less than epsilon. As always, when we're using the epsilon delta definition, it's going to be a two-step process. I'm going to first of all need to do some informal work to find what my delta is. Once I've found it, I can do a formal proof to, de to demonstrate that that value of delta will work. In finding delta, I usually start where I'm not allowed to start in the formal proof with my conclusion. So if I want the absolute value of x squared minus 4 to be less than epsilon, I'm just going to observe that I could factor this. So that factors as the absolute value of x plus 2 times x minus 2, and that's what I want to be less than epsilon. Absolute values distribute over multiplication, so this is the same as the absolute value of x plus 2 times the absolute value of x minus 2, which is what I want to be less than epsilon. Now this factor right here, that's exactly what I'm going to control with my delta. And here we see why quadratic functions and polynomials in general are more complicated than linear functions. When we did this with a linear function, our other factor was just a number. It was a positive number. We were able to divide both sides by that number, and then the result was what our delta was going to be. Here, my other factor involves an x. So I need to find some way of controlling the size of x plus 2. And I'm going to do that before I attempt to control the size of absolute value of x minus 2. So, to control the absolute value of x plus 2, I'm going to make an executive decision here that my delta value is going to be less than or equal to 1. You might say, why can I make that decision? Well, Somebody told, I was told just to find the delta. I wasn't told where to look other than that I had to look in the region of positive numbers. I'm pretty sure delta is going to be small, so I'm just not going to bother to look at big numbers. I'm making a choice that I'm only going to look at smallish numbers, numbers that are less than or equal to 1. But then, since I'm ultimately going to be controlling that the absolute value of x minus 2 will be less than delta, since that's less than or equal to 1, I will have that the absolute value of x minus 2 is less than 1. And what that means is that x minus 2 is trapped between 1 and negative 1. Anytime an absolute value is smaller than some number, the quantity inside the absolute value lies in between that number and its opposite. Okay, but now I can solve this for x. I'm just going to add 2 to each piece, so I'm going to get 1 is less than x is less than 3. I'm going to just draw that out on a number line. If 1 is here, and let's say 3 is here, this is telling me that x has to be somewhere in this region. Now what I'm going to try to do is control the absolute value of x. Because if I can control the absolute value of x, then a factor like this, I can use the size of the absolute value of x together with the triangle inequality to control the size of this factor. So right now, x is trapped between two numbers that are clearly not opposites of each other. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to just plot on my number line the opposite of these two numbers. The opposite of 1 would be negative 1, which is somewhere over here. And the opposite of 3 would be negative 3, which is further to the left. 
Now, if I look between negative 1 and 1, x isn't in between negative 1 and 1. So I cannot say that the absolute value of x is less than 1. But if I look between negative 3 and 3, x is in that region. And so I can say that if x is between 1 and 3, then x is also between negative 3 and 3, which means that the absolute value of x is smaller than 3. Now, using that in conjunction with the triangle inequality, I can say that the absolute value of x plus 2 is going to be less than or equal to the absolute value of x plus the absolute value of 2. That's going to be by the triangle inequality. But now I know that that's less than 3 plus 2. I know that this is less than 3, and I know that this is equal to 2, and so that's going to be 5. So by making this executive decision that delta is no bigger than 1, I can control that the absolute value of x plus 2 is, no, is smaller than 5. <laughs> now what I'm going to do is come back over here to the work that I was doing with this entire quantity, the absolute value of x minus 4. I've said that's going to be this, but now I can say the absolute value of x plus 2 times the absolute value of x minus 2, that's going to be less than 5 times the absolute value whoops, of x minus 2. That's by the work I did over here to control the size of this factor. And this starts to look more like what I saw when I was working with a linear function. Now, if I can make this less than epsilon, I'm not claiming that it necessarily is. I'm saying that's my new goal. My new goal is if I can make this less than epsilon, then that's going to imply that this is also less than epsilon, which was my original goal. But I can easily make this less than epsilon. I just need to make sure that the absolute value of x minus 2 is less than epsilon over 5. With a linear function, once we got to something that looked like this, we said that was our choice of delta. So I'm thinking my delta is probably going to be epsilon over 5. Assuming that epsilon was a small number, epsilon over 5 will also be less than 1, so that that's a legitimate choice. But if somebody gave me an epsilon that was big, because this is supposed to work for any epsilon, if epsilon was big, like epsilon was 100, epsilon over 5 would be 20. If I let delta just be epsilon over 5, I run the risk that my delta isn't less than 1. So all of this work here to control the size of the absolute value of x plus 2 is invalid. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to let delta be the smaller of these two things, 1 and epsilon over 5. Now, this is probably some new notation for you. Here I just have a set of two numbers. When I write the word min in front of it, that just says delta is going to be the choice of whichever of these two numbers is smaller. And if they happen to be the same size, if epsilon, for example, was, 10, was 5, so that epsilon over 5 was 1, well, then my delta would be 1. <laughs> But with that, I'm making sure that delta is less than or equal to 1 and less than or equal to epsilon over 5. So I get the benefits of it being no bigger than either one of these numbers. So that's my delta. So that's the informal work. We have now found our delta time for the formal proof, which means I need to erase the board first because we're out of space. Okay, so for the formal proof, remember we always start 
by saying let epsilon be bigger than zero. And the next line, we're going to introduce the delta that we found. So I'm going to let delta equal the smaller of 1 and epsilon over 5. And then to prove an if-then statement, I always suppose the if. So that's my third line. Suppose that 0 is less than the absolute value of x minus 2 is less than delta. And now what I need to do is consider the fact that delta is the smaller of these two things. So I need to sort of consider what happens from the fact that delta is no bigger than 1, and then what happens from the fact that delta is no bigger than epsilon over 5. <laughs> So what follows from this is that thus, the absolute value of x minus 2 is less than delta. Basically, for this proof, I don't need the fact that x isn't 2. So I'm just going to focus on the second part of that inequality. And I'm going to initially look at the fact that delta is less than or equal to 1. <laughs> so this implies, this is sort of an implication arrow. That says that what I'm about to write is going to be true because the line above it is true. That implies that the absolute value of x minus 2 is less than 1, which implies that x minus 2 is in between negative 1 and 1, which implies, just by adding that 2 across, that x is between 1 and 3. <laughs> now, that means that net x is also between negative 3 and 3. Because if x is bigger than 1, then it's certainly bigger than negative 3. And that implies that the absolute value of x is less than 3. Okay. Once I have that, I'm going to now consider the absolute value of x minus 2. Remember, consider is sort of a nice transition word. I wasn't talking about this factor at all. It appears like it's coming from nowhere, so I'm just introducing it. Now I'm going to talk about something new. This is the new thing I'm going to talk about. Now, the absolute value of x plus 2 is less than or equal to the absolute value of x plus the absolute value of 2. This is true by the triangle inequality. But now, I know that this piece is less than 3, and I know that this piece is equal to 2, so this fact, this thing right here, the absolute value of x plus 2, is less than 3 plus 2, which is equal to 5. <laughs> now, I'm going to need that in a moment. Okay. So I'm just going to say absolute value of x plus 2, less than 5, and I'm going to call that star. I'm going to refer back to that at some point a little bit later on. Okay. So here, I've spent some time using the fact that because delta is no bigger than 1, that allows me to control the size of the absolute value of x plus 2. <laughs> now, I'm also able to say since the absolute value of x minus 2 is less than delta, which is less than or equal to epsilon over 5, so now I'm going to look at the other choice I had, where I knew delta was the smaller of these two things. Okay. Since this is true, that implies that the absolute value of x minus 2 is less than epsilon over 5. And I'm just going to put a double star by that, because I'm going to need that. So notice, by two separate arguments here, I've controlled the size of this and this, which I know are the two factors of the absolute value of x squared minus 4. So, now let's consider 
the absolute value of x squared minus 4. There's a lot of changing gears in this proof. I talk about one thing, then I move on to talk about something else. So these transition words are really helpful for your reader to be able to follow the argument. This sort of says, okay, next thing. Okay. So the absolute value of x squared minus 4, I know that's equal to the absolute value of x plus 2 times x minus 2. But I know that absolute values distribute over multiplication, so that's equal to the absolute value of x plus 2 times the absolute value of x minus 2. And these are exactly the two things that I just spent all this time controlling the size of. So I now know that that is less than, this factor is less than 5, that would be by star, this factor is less than epsilon over 5. That would be by double star. So using that previous work, I can show that this thing is less than 5 times epsilon over 5, which is just epsilon. And that was my goal. So I'm going to, again, just state my conclusion to make it clear that I'm not stopping just because I'm tired. I'm stopping because I'm done. So thus, the limit as x approaches 2 of x squared is in fact 4. And there was much rejoicing.